perhaps uh, you know your kind of you know your backgrounds, what kind of you know issues you're grappling with in terms of uh, you know, funding, finances, taxes, accountancy, all this sort of thing. The one thing that I, I didn't always talk when I first left, get yourself a good, a good accountant. So uh, we've got a good accountant here. So over, over to Stephen. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I recognise a few people here, so I'm sorry you haven't got with me again. Rec might recognise yourself at the front there. Um, so I'm Managing Director of the Blue Skies Partnership. Um, so we specialise in media people and we look after quite a few. It's, it's, it's quite a difficult world out there at the moment and so we face a number of issues and people bring a number of issues to us. Now, this is a question and answer session, so I think from, as Mike says, it's really important that I find out who's actually here and what people do. So perhaps I could just do a show of hands on a couple of things. The first thing is, who here is self-employed? Who here is self-employed in one capacity or another, either sole trader or limited company? Okay, so most, most people. And two, of the people that are self-employed, how many people operate through a limited company? Okay, about, about a quarter. Okay, so can I assume the rest of the people are peers you earn or students? Okay, right. What I'd like to do is kind of split this session into a couple of main chunks. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll stand up actually. I'm much more comfortable standing up if that's okay. Um, what I'd like to do is split the session into a couple of main chunks. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to talk about and hear questions on is possibly limited company versus self-employed. The reason for that is a lot of people think they should be a limited company. Um, a lot of people are told they should be a limited company and a lot of people are forced into being a limited company and it's one of the hot potatoes that currently that we face pretty much every day. And, this, and the, second, the second thing is I think just when you pay a tax and how much you should save for it. So are there any other things that people would like me to cover? BAT, okay? Love it. Here's a day's topic in itself. Yeah. <laughs> any other topics? Any other topics? Limited companies, okay. So, limited, limited companies versus sole trader. So sole trader is often referred to as Schedule D. Um, certainly I refer to it as Schedule D and most, most people do refer to it as Schedule D. Um, I'll, the floor is open. I'll take any questions as they come up. Limited company versus Schedule D or limited companies. Ask away. Sorry, what's Schedule D? Schedule D is a sole trader, self-employed sole trader. One man band or a partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had a limited company at the Dramatic I was forced into having a limited yeah. company by a client. Uh, and now I'm going dormant because I'm going to smaller work and I don't feel that it's been cancelled back. Um, going back to being dormant, can you, can you talk about that? Like going back from uh, a limited company back to being sole trader. Okay. Going from anything to a limited company is very straightforward. And likewise, going from a limited company to anything, pay as well, or sole trade, or a partnership, is also very straightforward. Um, I would question why you want to keep the company dormant. Because there's a cost to keep the company dormant. Um, so to go from a limited company to self-employed, you, you literally just shut the company down. And to be honest, most people have a company name for a limited company that nobody else in the right mind would want, right? It's, it's just the way of the, the media world. Um, so my recommendation is if you finish with a limited company, you shut it down. Because it costs you a couple hundred quid to open another one. And to keep it running for a year is probably going to cost you a couple hundred quid or more. So my, my advice is literally shut it down. Do, go into sole trader work, which is fine. Sole trader work for most people is a very appropriate way to be. It really is. I know you save tax, but in truth, sole trader, simple, cheap, understandable, and predictable. That's in, in effect. And if your income's below 40, 50,000 a year, for very, very few people should you consider being a limited company. You, you, it's really not worth your while. Um, highly unlikely to go too well. For you, sir, all I would do is shut down your limited company, you register with the HMRC as self-employed, you pay your national insurance, which is pretty much going to get all the shot, and you save an appropriate percentage for tax. And the appropriate percentage for tax is not likely to be more than 25%. Um, 
Um, and if you if you become self-employed today, your first tax bill will be in January 2017. Can I just ask a question related? Yeah, sure. You obviously said you were made to be a limited. Yes. When you go to different companies and they say we'll only employ you if you're limited, yeah. or we'll only employ you if you're PAYE, yeah, I'm a limited company. What what laws or rights have you got to say? Actually, I don't want to be employed like that. This yes. is how I get employed. This is how I. Companies sometimes dictate, especially to the younger ones, and less experienced ones. This is the way we employ you for ten dollars. You didn't really hear that question. It's a really, really good question. question. It's a really, it's a real hot potato at the moment. Um, if, if you're told you have to be a limited company, do you have any rights in terms of what rights have you got to say no? I don't want to be a limited company because the choice will be in most cases, limited company or no work, or limited company or pay as you earn. In other words, limited company or a short term pay as you earn contract. Um, in short, it's not for you to decide. Because someone's got a job, you want a job. You either say yes or you don't work. That's the way it works most of the time. The best, that, the best that we, the best that we do in those circumstances is if I've got someone who's been told pay as you earn or a limited company, I'm looking for a pay rise. I'm looking for an increase in the rate, an increase in the rate. I'm trying for twenty percent, but every every percentage I get over. So if someone's on a day rate for a limited company at £300 a day, then I'm looking for about 350 360 to compensate so the person get, is getting the same clear money. It's hard to get that unless you're already in the company. Um, and particularly if you're self-employed, if you're Schedule D and you've been told you have to go limited, I will normally say, well actually on 300 a day plus holiday, I'm looking for about 360 pay as you earn. The reason and, and this, is, this is important. The reason that people want you to be a limited company is not for your benefit. No matter how they position it, if someone says you have to be a limited company, you're not getting a job, the reason for that is that they don't want risk. Right? And if you become a limited company, then you carry the risk. And the risk is... And it's set out quite, this is the bet to tax and freelancers. I read it before I came in, that's why I'm worried about the tax. <laughs> no, but I'm not, I'm not joking. This that's is bloody brilliant, yeah. right? That's a really, really clear, concise summary of the, the important things, okay? The back three or four pages in this tell you who can be, who can be self-employed. If you cannot be self-employed, you should not be a limited company, okay? If, it, if your grade, your job is not in the back of this book, <coughs> Under no circumstances should you be a limited company. Okay, it's really important. If someone says, "Boy, oh, you should be a limited company because it'll save you tax," um, I'll use a technical accounting term: it's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> it is really bollocks. It's because you are reducing their risk. If you're Schedule D, sole trader, and a company employs you, and the rules are broken, these are the rules that are in this booklet then they carry the risk. The person who hires you, if you're self-employed, will get a tax bill from the tax man of roughly half the money you've been paid. And it goes back six years. So if you if you get £50,000 from someone to Schedule D, and you're employed by Endemol, and Endemol break the rules, they'll get a bill of twenty-five grand. Endemol say, once again, come back to technical accounting terms, sod that for the game is over. Right? Why don't you become a limited company? Because it's brilliant to be a limited company. It's fantastic. You'll save so much tax, but what that means is, instead of them getting a twenty-five thousand pound bill when in the multi rules, you get a bill. It'll be less, but it would still be ten thousand pounds. So there's no such thing, right, as a good deal if someone's telling you to be a limited company. It's really, really important, um, and I cannot emphasise it enough. We spend a lot of time fighting people getting pushed into limited companies. We look after about eight hundred people. 200 of them are limited companies. And the reason for that is, first of all, the person's a total nightmare and can't organise themselves. Right? If you're a total nightmare and can't organise yourself, don't be a limited company. It's true. Right? It's, people are smiling, but it's absolutely true. Right? Um, if you uh, are no good at saving for tax, don't be a limited company. If you work for companies and you break the rules and you won't even know what the rules are, right? but the rules are in here, this tax guide, nice and simple. Right? If, 
the rules are broken, you're going to have the bill. And the other thing is, although everybody will save tax by being a limited company, there are some things you can't claim for, there are some things that cost more, and some things you have to claim for in a different way. So if you start off with a tax saving, which is this high, right, and then you think, well, actually, my accounting fee is higher, so that reduces the benefit. I can't claim from a car in the same way, that reduces the benefit. I don't get holiday pay, that reduces the benefit. You can end up with deadly score benefit. And that's why we look at it and we look at everything we think, should this person be a limited company, given what we know about that person? But where someone has been forced into being a limited company, or given the choice of being a limited company, I'm looking for a 20% uplift. We don't always get, in fact, rarely do we get 20%. But if I can get 10%, the person's got a job, and they're not as badly off, and they're risk-free, if they go pay us around with a 10% hike. But I think another, another thing to look out for, limited company, I mentioned one of the big disadvantages is you don't get holiday pay. Now, some people, can I just do a show of hands? Who here gets holiday pay on top of a rate? It doesn't apply to pay as young people or students, right? One person. You're self-employed? Occasionally. Uh, occasionally. I'm a mix, actually. Of, um, right. Okay. Right. It's, well, the fact of the matter is that if, if you're a job in Cameron and a job in Southman, it's very difficult to get a holiday pay. Okay? And a lot of contracts these days will say your rate's 300 a day, including holiday pay of £30. Okay? Your rate's actually 270 a day, no matter how you look at it. If you're a limited company, they only have to give you 270 a day you're not legally entitled to holiday pay. I'm doing a great job selling this. Everybody else wants yeah. something. <laughs> Go on then. Right. It's also available to back to members on the website. So if you try, sign up with back to today, you get, a, you get a free copy. Some of you will miss out on it. But, uh, right. There's some more downstairs. There's more downstairs. More downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I'll let everyone finish reading the book, okay? <laughs> now, it, it seriously is a very, very good book. It's, it's simple. The problem with tax and accounts is it's written in jargon, right? Um, but that's a very, very simply good book, okay? So, I've sort of waffled on a bit about limited company versus self-employment and about CCD, but it... In my view, most people should start off being Schedule D, so trader, and then move to a limited company once they've got used to a certain process. <coughs> yeah. Once they've got used to the, the mechanism of being Schedule D, as, as Mike here said, you go from being pay as you earn, where you've got a full support network, to being Schedule D, so trader, self employed, and all of a sudden it's the world of difference. It's the loneliest place in the world. You have no idea how well you're doing, you have no idea how much you should be charging. Um, you have no idea, it's just a different world. And I've had, I've talked to people, taking people on as clients who are, say, the BBC, who earn hundreds of thousands of pounds, with hundreds of people working for them. And in front of me, we're just having a chat about self-employment and how it all works. And they're totally clueless. In the nicest possible way, they don't have a clue. They don't know how to go about having meetings, they don't know how to go about looking at their contracts, they don't know how to go about charging, they don't know how much to charge. And yet they've got jobs earning huge amounts of money with 400 people looking for them. And what I can say without exception is every single person who goes freelance is exactly the same. Sorry, two, two questions yourself first. Uh, yeah, you're on the financial yeah. uh, side, the, one of the benefits of a limited company would be you're limited in liability. So something wrong or something happened in your job, your mortgage isn't attached to that with your personal life, you can just shut it down. So isn't that an advantage of a limited company over some Very, very good point. Very good point. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, very, very good point. The thing is, if you're a, a PD, or you're a production manager, or you're an exec producer, the chances of you actually building up any risk because all you're doing is you're supplying your brain power, you turn up, you do your job, you go home. You might be there 25 hours, but you do your job and you go home. So the actual risks that you can incur are very low. Because the big advantage of a limited company in relation to that particular point is that if you are someone who puts packages together, okay, so in other words, you get a call from America, 
you hire a load of people, you, you hire a studio, you hire a kit, then that could easily cost 100,000. You develop, you, 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 you produce your output, and you give it to the Yanks, and they say, actually, we've just gone bust. You're 100,000 pounds out of pocket. So it's a very, very valid point. But for most people, they're not in that game. They're not in that game. There's very, very few. I don't know how many people in the room do that type of package work. Yeah, one. So one. And to be honest, sorry, yourself as well. Yeah, yeah. something. I did something wrong, and it went on air, yeah. and there was a mistake I made. Yeah. I could potentially be liable yeah. to cover costs. So I'm just a sole one person. I, I would insure against that. Okay, so you would be a sole trader insurer. I would insure against that because first of all, it's cheaper. Second of all, it's more flexible. Um, there's many different ways to skin a cat, no disrespect to cats, but there's many, many different ways to skin a cat. So I would I would insure against that. I would take out the appropriate insurances, which would be, I suppose, professional indemnity, public liability. And I know that there's a school of a train of thought that says you don't need insurance if you're self-employed. I absolutely dispute that. I think that sleeping at night is really important. Yeah? And it's better for a hundred quid a year of insurance and sleep at night then save 100 quid. Are you okay with that? Yeah? yeah. Sorry, you had a question at the back. If I've got this right, you were employed, you've now registered as self-employed yeah. as a DOP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you had no work until January, is that going to be a problem? And the short answer to that is no. At the end of the day, you might not work for a year. You could register as a writer and generate no income for five years. Okay. So what do you get self-employed obviously? Invoicing, invoicing the, or getting your job to say the BBC, yeah. uh, don't raise invoices. Does that mean that would be a pay as you earn job? Or is it? Yeah. Yeah. So the, reason I, the reason I'm asking for clarification is the BBC operates what's called self billing. In other words, they bill, they raise a bill from you to themselves. You don't raise the bill. But that doesn't make you pay as you earn. Right, pay as you earn is whether you're up tax, national insurance, you're, you've got, you start to get legal rights, uh, and you've got a contract of employment. If you sign a contract, the chances are it's a contract of self-employment, and then you're just not giving them a bill because they've got self-billing. Most major companies now will do self-billing, BBC, ITV, um, because it gives them control. And to be honest, it saves you time. No, no, that's so it's, if, if you have a contract of employment, that's pay as you earn, you put it on your tax return. Yeah, You put it on your tax return exactly as you would do, do, do before. You'd say, I work for the BBC, here's my P60, which is the thing they give you at the end of the year. They paid you this amount of money, they deducted this amount of tax, it goes on your tax return. And the second part of your question was, is it okay to be self-employed and pay as you earn at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. So, on the assumption... Oh, well, to answer the question for everybody else, the answer is yes. No. So the question is if you're, if you're invoicing abroad, if you're working abroad and invoicing abroad. Um, there are some technicalities in terms of VAT, but I'm not talking VAT at the moment because we said we'll cover that later. Um, if you're invoicing abroad, you're invoicing from the UK, yeah, you work in the UK, UK based, so you're invoicing abroad. The only important thing is, are you sure you get paid, and what currency will you get paid in, and when will you get paid? Yeah? 
when we get paid. So there's no difference. But what's important is your contract at the beginning. I cannot emphasise enough. And I know people will work for three weeks before they get a contract. I know some people get a contract the day they're leaving. You should always know what's in your contract. Because for all you know, they could be paying you in something dinars. You know, Afghan dinars or something. And what are you going to do with it? Nothing. So you check the contract. And it'll tell you who you invoice, when you get paid, and how you'll get paid. What currency. But it's no difference. It doesn't matter whether I mean, Scotland's a foreign country. God's sake. If you invoice Scotland, you get paid in pounds, you make sure of it. Yeah? Until we get independence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes? If you income is forced by a company to go on to the company status, yeah. and then works for, for a company, and this this contract has come goes on and on and on and on. So as far as in their revenue is concerned, they look at you, you're actually going to be paid by you. Yeah. Who's liable? You are. The thing is, you're, you're forced to the degree that you have, but you still have a choice. The choice is not to be able to do it. And at the end of the day, you could argue through an employment tribunal, which is harder, that in actual fact you should be treated like an employee. That's the, the, the recourse, that's your only recourse is through an employment tribunal. I don't know if you agree with that. Forced to that, that's that. Yeah. After six months, you turn around to the company and say, "You should be paid to go away." So you can get back, maybe in writing, and they still refuse. That changes the trade This week, I just want to make sure I understand that. Okay. If you're forced in, if you're forced into being a limited company, so you're working at the same placement, do you have any rights? Do you have any recourse? And the answer to that is no except through an employment tribunal, that's my professional view, because HMRC will just look at you and say, it's you down to you. Are you legally allowed to do that? Or would you work as a limited company for years for one of no, the companies? No, no. The, the, the problem is that in tax law, you're not. In, in uh, employment law, you're not. So your only recourse is really, the tax man will come after you, because it's your company that signed the contract. Right. But in employment law, you can argue that you've only worked for one place, you were, you came in at nine in the morning. You went to eight at night. You worked six days a week. You were told what to do. You were told how to do it. You used all their equipment. Therefore, in the eyes of employment law, you're an employee. I've just spent about three, possibly well, since last September, arguing with the company that's refusing to pay one of my clients' holiday pay, and they've just paid a five thousand pounds check, and they've also had to pay everybody else. But it's taking, like, that's what, nine months, eight months? And my client won't work for that company again. Is there a stipulated duration of time, you know, that that, that, that situation can be allowed to, to go on for? When do, when do tax people come in? Well, the tax man could come in four days after you join the company. Or yeah. they could come in ten years after you join the company. Everyone, everyone in the room, sorry, I haven't seen it. Everyone in, uh, everyone in the room will know someone Pretty sure who's worked at one company for 10 years through a limited company, right? And they'll say, Oh, my friend does it, it's a time bomb, right? But you could literally start working for a company as I don't know, let's take a grade that's not allowed to be self employed, a system producer or a researcher, not a specialist researcher. Researcher, you get a job and they say, You be a limited company, and you start there, and you're only there a week. And HMRC come into that company and say, Right, tell me who you've got working for you, I want all the records. And they go through and they say, ah, oh, this person here, they're doing research. Ah, says the company. They are their own limited company. Nothing to do with us. And the tax man will say to you, why is it you are a researcher with your own limited company? You shouldn't be. And then you're in trouble. Yeah? Sorry, can I just address this point across here first, please? I was just going to say, is this what would be termed as IR35? Um, it, it, it is, but... Well, you're not allowed to let for 40 of the time, but... Nah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on it. Um, the, the question is about IR35, and IR35 is a particular piece of legislation that was brought in about 2000, designed to stop people leaving a job on Friday, starting the same, come back in on the Monday as a company, and working for 10 years. 
they get little or no tax, the company that engages them pays little or no national insurance, and the government, once again, to use a vernacular, said, sod that for the good soldiers, we can't afford it. And so they brought in this legislation called IR35, which addresses the point that you raised, and, um, which is who can be self-employed and who should be employed, because that's all it's designed to catch, is people who should be employed. Okay? Um, and so the government gets more tax. So, but the, the media world and television and film is it, such a wonderful, tragic place. Right? It really is. It's a wonderful, tragic place. And it has its own rules. To a degree, it has its own rules. So if, you're, if you get a job with Sainsbury's on the checkouts on a Monday, so every Monday night you're in Sainsbury's checkouts, Tuesday you're in Waitrose checkouts, Wednesday you're in Tesco's checkouts, Thursday you're in John Lewis, and Friday you're in Aldi. Right? You cannot be a limited company in each of those jobs and argue that because you've got five jobs, you're allowed to have a limited company. You, you can be self-employed because at the end of the day, it's what you do in each job, the specifics of each job. So the 40% rule, not quite right. Okay, sorry, it was this lady across here. So I'm consistent producer. I always write contracts. Yeah. Business, so I'm on payroll. Yeah. I'm going to be thinking about. So you can't be self-employed if you're consistent producer. No. That's um, all my questions. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 okay. Um, what's the difference between an assistant producer and an associate producer? Right? What's the difference? At the end of the day, fun? What did, well, but, but it does depend where they're working as well, and it does depend. I can argue that someone's called an assistant producer for budgetary reasons so they can cut the money. Yeah? Uh, it's, it comes down to what they do. What I'm saying is that you, you can always make an argument that someone is an assistant producer, you look at what they're doing. Because lots of people will be called assistant producers, but in actual fact they're associate producers, and vice versa, for different reasons. Well, yeah. Um, there are games that you can play, but the taxman knows these games. But what you do is you, what I tend to do is I say to the person, right, write down everything you do, who you report to, size of production, and then I just walk it to HMRC and say, okay, I have this person, I'm going to give you what's and all. This is what they do. I would like this person to be scheduled D. Do you agree? Right? And then they have to make a negative decision to say no. Once you've got that permission, then you just can invoice your next job because you would normally get a little letter, or we tend to get a little letter, it's only four lines long, saying, for this job, this person can be regarded as scheduled D. End of story. The next job might be totally different. It's every job, every person, possibly a different decision. It's a case of knowing the rules and thinking about it and justifying it. Is that okay for that one? Yeah? Sorry, across the back. Right. Well, if the crew have invoiced you, it once again depends on what they're doing. Because if you I don't have any issues with a little green book, but if they're in that list of grades, they can are allowed to be self-employed. They can invoice you. You don't have to deduct national insurance. But if they're not in that book, and there's some other little things I don't know, um, seven-day rule, Lorimer letters, it, it, it's a bit of a minefield. Okay, so a researcher can work for you for less than seven days, and you have to give them a pay slip, but you don't have to deduct that tax, but you do have to deduct national insurance. So it's a five-day five shoot. Um, if they're in that book of self-employed, they can give you an invoice. If they're not in that book of self-employed, you have to put them on the payroll, but you don't have to deduct tax. Put them on the payroll, but I don't have to deduct tax. It's under the seven-day rule. And it is absolutely one of the, another bit of vernacular. It's one of the biggest pains in the arses out the seven day rule, right? It is awful because it means you've got to go to the expense of running a payroll to give someone a pay slip for three days and you paid them 80 quid and it cost you 24 quid to give them that pay slip, right? Um, I wouldn't necessarily accept an invoice without doing it that way. So in some, in, oh sorry, in summary, if, some, if, you're, if you're employing uh, a camera person who's employed, who's got their own gear, they can invoice you. Okay. If you've got a runner, 
They can't invoice you. You have to give them an, uh, a pay slip. Okay? But look in the book and look at the, specifically under seven day rule. For a five day shoot, seven day rule. Okay? And it's very, very simply put in there. And if in Much doubt, simply. if in doubt, take advice. Okay? Take advice because it's not as simple. We look after quite a few people who basically package shoots and put them together, particularly one off shoots. Know, maybe three days, five days, seven days. It is, it's, a, it's a license to lose money. Right? It's a, it's, by the time you get through all the rig rules, it's a license to lose money. Some of them are reporting VAT as well. And I'm wondering, do I need to register the VAT to pay my tax? Yes. Back four years, five years actually. I mean, you can go back, so you can say, "I did this work in last month." Look at the amount of that in total. So, if it's like fifty quid, don't worry about it. It's not worth the hassle. If it's five grand, then register, and then you'll get, you'll, you'll have to charge back to who you are doing the job for, unless they're abroad and there's particular rules in place. But you'll get that back back that you've paid. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. So, we're just checking it here. Um, I uh, sort of, with a couple of friends, do sort of freelance video production stuff, yeah. and we're all essentially self-employed. Um, one of my friends, uh, I hired for a job, mm -hmm. and then found out for I paid him because we went for money compliance. He hadn't registered self-employed at that point. So he registered self-employed, and then we got paid by the client. He got let through from HMRC, say, yeah, registered. I transferred money to his bank account, fine. The other day, he got a letter from the post saying something was wrong with the registration. Don't know what it was, and I said, just call, find out what it is, and so I have a phone. It suddenly dawned on me as I've come in here, what happens if somehow they've screwed up so much that he isn't registered self-employed and I've now paid him and such. Okay. Is that, could that be a new issue? Or that? Is that okay, so once, once again, a very interesting but very complicated point. Um, but the crux of it is, forget, forget the bit about three friends, etc. but the crux of it is, if someone tells you they're self-employed and it turns out that possibly they're not, or they're definitely not, what are the implications? At, at, the, end, at the end of the day, um, <coughs> If someone is a foreign national, you have to actually verify that they've got the right to work in the UK. Okay? Um, forget self-employment. They have to have the right to work in the UK. And you have to see their original visa or the original passport. And the passport will say whether they've got, well, effectively say whether they've got the right to work. And you have to copy it, etc., etc. So that's the first thing. The second issue is if someone gives you an invoice, then they're responsible for the tax. As long as you've verified who they are, they're responsible for the tax. The tax man couldn't necessarily, and I'm pretty sure they couldn't come after you personally, okay, for that, as long as they're doing a job that's in that list. Because if they're not doing a job that's in that list, then they cannot be self-employed. And you should know that and be reliable. With, with the situation, me directly, I just transferred the money to him. Yeah. So, but, but I, I know a similar situation. One of my friends, who I occasionally hire as well, uh, he was running a small company doing Asian wedding videos. And two of his friends were not registered. He taught them to register and he paid them. And basically, obviously, they questioned this. And um, it got sorted out, but he did have a panic situation where he spent the night himself, because officially, HMRC were going, are you, you're saying you're paying these people, but we've not got any record of them, and such like that. So I, I, I've got friends who've had this situation where they, they've ended up in, it's all been cleared, but the other two ended up having paid fines, and one of them had been essentially self-employed for two years, but hadn't been registered, and obviously had a massive fine to pay. If someone, you, you have three months to register self-employment, sorry, to register with HMRC for self-employment from the day you first start being self-employed. So you have three months, okay? Um, it's 
after three months, you get £100 fine. So if the fine was £100, that's not the end of the world. You'll hate writing cheque, you'll hate doing all that, but it's not the end of the world. Okay? If the fine's ten grand, there's something really serious. It's not at all what you're thinking. Um, you should never ever pay someone unless you know who you're paying, you know their name, you know their address, and you know how to break the legs. <laughs> no, seriously, you, should, you shouldn't pay anyone unless they've given you something that gives you all the details. And you should never pay in cash. Yeah? You should never pay in cash. So, as long as you follow those rules, you shouldn't have a problem. And just remember the bees aside and all this kind of stuff. You shouldn't have a problem. So, there's another question over here, I think. Right, okay. So, the, the question is what expenses can you claim as a sole trader against a limited company? Oh, this is lovely. <coughs> this is lovely. Okay. So, a sole trader, right? About 15 years ago, I claimed for Viagra. Not for me, but I did claim for Viagra <laughs> for, for a client, okay? And I claimed for Viagra because it wasn't commonly available in the UK. And my client was buying Viagra because it was a drug of choice in clubs, so and he was buying it to see if he could buy it. And he wrote an article about it, okay? So he gave me a visa bill. That's which, what he said, yeah. Which had $500, $500 in New York for delivery of Viagra, right? Now, I can tell you this guy was self-employed, okay? And the tax man queried it. And I got it through, I got it through his research. And the tax man said, well, what for? And I told him it was for writing an article. And the article was written, you know, it was, it was a proper article. He got paid for it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and the tax man said, well, it says in the bottom of this visa bill, just to see if I could buy Viagra on the internet, and then I can, exclamation mark, I can, exclamation mark, I can, exclamation mark, right? That wouldn't go through as a limited company. Be very, very difficult to argue that because the rules for claiming for self employment expenses are different from limited company. And when you're self employed, I will, I'll bore you with the details, right? I'll bore you with the details. When you're self employed, it's wholly and necessarily for business, right? Sorry, wholly and exclusively for business. But when you're a limited company, it's wholly, uh, exclusively, and necessarily for business, okay? So, Right, there's, there's sod all trading within the industry unless you're the BBC. Okay, there's very little trading. So how do you get training? How, if you're if you're a, a director, how do you get training in what you do? You basically have to watch what other people do. You have to talk to other people. You have to spend time developing your own techniques because it's sod all training. Now, I've had huge arguments with the tax man, which I won, about. Why is it someone who's self-employed can claim research? So research for self-employment is for someone who's on the audiovisual side, okay? Not necessarily a production manager on the production administration side. It's really for the audiovisual. It would be something like um, cinema, theater, DVDs, music, magazines, newspapers, maps. It's very, very broad. It's really, really broad. So I can argue with that with the tax man and say, and I did use the argument, saving private line, first 15 minutes, groundbreaking, I know it's been done before, but it's groundbreaking TV, and lots of people have copied it, and they wouldn't necessarily be able to copy it, they hadn't seen it, so they bought the DVD so they could see it, right? And that wins. But for a limited company, they say, but it's not necessary that you buy that DVD. Even though it's wholly and exclusively for business and the sod all training, it's not necessary and you'd lose that argument. So it's actually very technically complicated. So the, the, in general, you can't claim for a car in the same way if you're a limited company. I'll say, I'll pick up in a second, okay? You cannot claim for a car in the same way if you've got a limited company. If you don't have a, a green car, I don't mean green car, I don't, you know what I mean? It has to be environmental friendly, you shouldn't put it through a limited company. Most people are better off claiming mileage at 45 or 50 pence a mile. But if you're a sole trader, you claim the car through the company because it's beneficial to do so. Don't forget that when you've got a limited company, you're an employee of your own company. It's totally different. That's why, as the gentleman over there says, you're public, you, you, you've got limited liability because 
That's your limited company, that's you. You're separate. You're an employee of your own company. When you are a sole trader, you and the company are the same person. That's why you can lose your house. If it goes wrong. If you run up huge debts that you can't pay, you can lose your house. Because you and the company are that. But when you're a limited company, you're separate. You're totally separate. And there's this big gap between you. But if, if you're an employer, because it's your company, give you a car, it's given to you as if you worked at the BBC, or if you worked at ITV, or if you worked for whoever. It's a benefit to you. Therefore, you have to pay tax on it. That's why you don't claim for a car through a limited company. Okay? Unless it's an environmentally friendly car. I don't let you come. Perfect run through a company. Extension lead is bloody huge. But, <laughs> right? I run electric cars perfect. I wouldn't run a Range Rover through a limited company because the tax could be 700 quid a month. Personal tax. Okay? But there are so many differences. For example, holiday pay you can't claim. Um, but also, things cost more. Accounting fees cost more. Um, bank accounts, you have to have a special bank account. You have a business bank account. It costs you about 300 quid a year after you've got through your um, tax for your uh, free charging period. It's really expensive. And it's technically quite challenging sometimes. But the, the, the thing is, the things you can claim for, you can't claim for, if you're self employed, I would claim for half your Sky subscription. I would claim for probably 75% of your BT landline if you've got one. Who has got a landline these days? You claim for your mobile bills. Well, the only, of those things I've just said, the only thing you can claim for through a limited company is your mobile. And only if it's in the company name. Really important, if you're running through a limited company, make sure, honestly, I'll pick up in a second. I don't want you getting right? You can only claim for a, a mobile through a limited company if it's in the company name. Right? Whereas you can claim for all these things dead easy to a sole trader. Right? It's simple. Right? The old thing, keep it simple, stupid, that works for a sole trader. Right? Limited companies, you get it wrong, it's really, really painful. You have to have a pay slip every month. If you don't get a pay slip every month as a limited company, £100 fine every month. £1,200 a year. Practically non appealable. If you take your money out of the limited company, before you have a pay slip, before you have a pay slip, hundred pounds penalty every month, right? And the first thing you'll know about it is eighteen months down the line when you've got a bill for eighteen hundred quid. If you hand your stuff in once a year and someone says, "Where are your pay slips?" Don't know. Yeah, limited companies fantastic in certain circumstances, but just consider all the options. Straightforward. Then a very long-winded way of addressing that. It's bloody hard for a limited company, but it's worthwhile sometimes. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Sorry, it's this lady at the front of my phone. Um, I worked the PAYE part-time and I went self-employed. Sorry, I went self-employed also for the part that I wasn't working. But my question is, when is too soon to start doing self-employed? Because I didn't really understand. I got the desk space, I was doing for three months and coming up from journalism and stuff. And, you know, but I wasn't actually making any money. I was really contacting tax myself, self-employed, and I was like, Generating anything, then we came up to Palava to get out of it. It took ages, and then they said yes, and then they said something else, and then they said, you know, the adventure of the because I'm no longer self employed. But in terms of going forward again, when exactly should you let them know you are self employed? So the, the question is, when should you let the tax man know you're self employed? Particularly, you know, and I think the other side to the question I took from it is, if you're spending money, yeah, yeah you're and you're not making it, should you still tell them? Uh, and the answer to the answer to that is, um, you've got three months to tell them. You can be the most unsuccessful self-employed person in the world, right? No, but seriously, if you're a writer, you might not get money in for two years. You, you, but you're actually putting yourself out there as a writer day one. You register day one. The reason for that is you can claim loads of things. But when you do start making money, you can then claim against that. Or if you've got pay as you earn, as you said you had, you can offset that against your pay as round tax. In other words, you get a tax rebate. Right? So if you're earning 20 grand a year for pay as you earn, and you become self-employed, it costs you, say, £5,000 a year to be self-employed, then you take your 5000 a year, it's a loss. You haven't made any money. You make nothing. You've got a loss of 5000 It immediately takes, what will it take, um, £1,000 off your, you've got a pay as you earn tax rebate of £1,000, which helps you out. 
So it's not a bad thing. In fact, I would positively recommend that if you're actually putting yourself out there as self-employed, you register the day one. Register the day one, because all you've got to do is add up your receipts and put on a tax return. You don't need a posh accounting for it. Yet you might as well get some money back from your pay as you earn tax. If you haven't got pay as you earn income at the same time, you still register, and I would still add it and put it on there. Sorry, there was, a, there was a question at the back, this gentleman here. Is that okay for you? Yeah. You waited ages for it, so I think it's okay. Hi, sorry, just really quickly. I uh, just wanted a clarification on when you were talking about when you're doing a job, it goes on for months and months, and you're effectively working almost like a full time employee. Uh -huh. Does it still count as self employed or does the same rules apply if you're a sole trader? Because we were talking about being one of the company. Yeah. But it's still the same thing if you're working for a sole trader. If you're a sole trader, it is the company that hires you that has to pay the bill if they get it wrong. Uh, there are three production companies that have either just been finished or have an investigation by HMRC or HMRC are in there at the moment in London for exactly this. Okay? Um, one of them who employed a client of ours, and we've been saying for ages you have to go pay as you earn, um, it'll wipe them out. It's only a small company. Two, two, uh, two freelancers, two self-employed freelancers in one limited company. And the bill will probably be 100,000. The person who's the sole trader, a client, they've been interviewed by HMRC, they've gone through everything they do, we provide whatever support they can on it. But I've already said to the person who hired them, you shouldn't have this person, it'll take you out. You need to put them on staff now. And he didn't do it. So, it's down to him, but the guy who's the limited company working for the same company, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. So there was another question at the back there, I think. No? Oh, can, I, can I just ask, can I just, it seems to me a, a useful point. In terms of the services that an accountant provides, could you describe you know, what, what the benefits are of having a good accountant? Um, well, there's a lot of shite ones out there. <laughs> it's, um, it's an absolute fact. Uh, I, I don't know how to put this, but so I'll just put it. Right? If you hand your stuff into an accountant once a year, and you do all your bookkeeping, and you're effectively telling the accountant what you can claim for, then the accountant takes your numbers and asks a couple of questions and puts it on a set of accounts go on to a tax return, that's an hour's work. That's an hour's work. Okay? Um, it takes longer to do the sign you up as a client and to chase you for the cash than it does to do the tax return and the accounts. Okay? Um, in that scenario, you're always going to get bad news. Boy, I wish you'd done it this way. Boy, I wish you'd done it that way. Because if you'd have done it that way, you'd save tax. Um, but now it's too late. Okay? Um, that's not helpful. It's really not helpful. I'd, I've got a very particular view because you'd expect that because I'm an opinionated job. But you, you end up with a situation where tax and accounts is something that interests Who here is interested in tax accounts? You've got 50 people in this room, but who the hell cares about it? Nobody. Right? It's true. Who likes writing a tax check? Nobody. I tell people every year, we've saved you this amount of money, we've made you that amount of money, but who likes writing the tax check? Nobody, if you wrote checks anyway. But I mean, whether you pay it online, it's one lump sum goes out and it makes you cry, right? The only thing that people tend to look at on their accounts is how much money they've built and how, how does it relate to last year, so is their money going up or down, right? How much is a tax bill and how much are they paying their accounts? In Maine, that's all people are interested in. And do you know if the government said tomorrow you don't have to do accounts, they'd say, sod that, I don't want to do it. So the answer is, anyone who just does that, in my view, is just, it, it's, it is money flow through. Right? I employ 20, 20, 21 people who look after the eight other clients. If I was a traditional accountant, who just time to stuff in once a year, I would employ seven or eight, maybe 29. Okay? It's money for all growth, seriously. It's no different from my latest money flow through. My interest is moving forward, right? A number is a number, it's only a number, it has no value. But what you do with a number is important. 
So where you want to get to is important. It's not where you've been. I don't care where you've been. You don't care where you've been. It's where you're going. So that, to my mind, is a good account. And that means I'm a good account. Although I'm not perfect, because I'm not really. <laughs> so I, I can't say it any better than that. That's, that's, that's it. Really good. So we've got five minutes. Okay. Some burning um, questions. So you, you can also sort of say that um, yeah, the next session is coming in here in about five minutes' time. Stephen, hopefully available for a chat if, if you want next door. Is that yeah, yeah. Two, one, two, eleven. Yeah, yeah. two eleven. So if anybody's got any kind of personal things or something yeah. that you know you, you have the time to bring up at the moment. My team are doing one to one yeah. downstairs, yeah. which is fifteen minutes. So, um, but we need to clear the room in about five minutes' yeah. time. So burning, burning questions. Do you have to register as a sole trader for each way that? Uh, interesting point. Grade is different. If someone, if someone, people progress. You know, I look after someone ten years ago who was an AP, and now they're running a channel, right? They progress. And you go from an AP to a producer, <coughs> to a senior producer, to a senior producer, to an exec, and blah blah. Right? I don't re-register them every time they, they get promotion because they could go the other way as well. They could say F off and live telly or you know whatever, and screw something up and they go back to it. <coughs> Basically, they're a producer. Or the resource producer, and then every year as they move forward on the tax return, I just change it from the AP to producer, series producer, back to producer, up to exec, whatever it happens to be. I don't register them, deregister them every time. Now, if someone has, um, for example, if they're a writer and they're also a director, in actual fact, they have two different jobs, and the tax man would argue they would really like two different. They'd like to register, not. To well, I suppose you're registering twice, but you actually tell them. But what you do is you tell them on the tax return. They'll be looking for two self-employment pages on the tax return. One for writer and one for director. Okay? Um, most people tend to look at that and think, nah. Because uh, you'll argue a point and say, no, in actual fact, I can get around that. Because it is a pay. Who wants to pay for two sets of accounts? No one. So what we try and do is we try and do it in a slightly different way. You register once for self-employment, no matter how many trades you've got, on your tax return you show them self-employment. If, if they're totally different trades. If, you, you know, if you're a, a self-employed bus driver right, and an exec producer, they're two different things. There'll be two, two pages on the tax return. Sorry, yourself, yeah. Got a couple of points for Hina and the limited group. Yeah. Is it okay to operate limited and self-employed? Um, I wouldn't because why should you pay There's no value in it. You've got two accountants' bills, one's expensive and one's cheaper, but you've still got two accountants' bills and you're still getting right to check. But unless, I guess, some client is too self-employed, they want to maintain self-employed, they can get that. I would do my sums on that one. But the other thing is, um, when you go in for your limited company jobs, you say my rate is 360 instead of 300. If you say it's 300 plus holiday, you'll get 300. And for your self-employed jobs, I mean, it's just it's horses for courses, right? The worst thing you do, you become a limited company and you say, my rate is, and you think, I was on 1500 at the BBC, my rate's 1500, but you were getting extra money from the BBC and all that, not on all the time, to be intent. So you say, my rate is 1500 plus 10.77 percent, which is the packed rate, and 12.07 percent, which is the vector rate, which is technically correct. So I always go for 12 percent. Okay. So take the rate, add 12 percent. Yeah, and then put it all through your limited company. There's no point having a self-employment and a limited company unless you need it, and you don't. Yeah. Sorry. Any other? We've only got how long? On? Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. That's a sec. <laughs> Thirty seconds is sex, isn't it? Right. V A T. Oh. 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 <laughs> Yeah, could we move next door for that one? Seriously, yeah, have to, I mean, yeah. that's, that's a big, big issue. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's a seminar on it. So, listen, folks, I think we really have to wrap it there. Can I um, thank um, Stephen? I think it's been a really valuable session. I mean, a lot of I mean, stuff that I was thinking, gosh, have I done it right as well, you know? Um, but Stephen will be available next door. There's also the, the, the stalls downstairs as well. Go and have a chat with the people there as well. Yeah. Set up one to ones. There's loads of information around. You've got the Back to um, Handbook there. If you go on the, on the Becky website, you can download it. If you haven't managed to get pick up a copy, but I think there are copies downstairs. For those of you who haven't joined Becky yet, please join. It's worth its weight in gold. I mean, I was thinking about uh, public liability insurance. 25 quid a year. That's an absolute bargain in comparison with how, how much you pay elsewhere. 
Um, there's a 25% there's a offer today if you join up today. Get down the front desk and join. It's, it's the best thing you will have done if you haven't joined already. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and we'll see you soon.